In the last week or so, my subscription count has gone through the roof and Doris from Aldi Books had put out a shout out video where she included me among many other booktubers who are all, all amazing. And Doris, I think my subscription count went up by at least 20, 25 people. Thank you so much for putting me on that list, for talking about me in your video. And I really appreciate it. When I get to the point where I have as many subscribers as you, hopefully I will do the same thing and shout out small booktubers to try to give them a little bit of a boost. Um, if you have subscribed and it's not because of Doris's channel, I can only conclude it's because of my sparkling personality, charm, and, and endless wit and self-deprecating humor, of course. Oh, and my intelligence. <laughs>
I have a book haul and this is a different one and I'm not going to actually tell you the the reason the big reason until I'm done so yes this is this is a plug and this is a cliffhanger and I'm going to make you wait but I think my reason is pretty good so let me get going I've got 16 books to show you what well, I'm recounting there's seven uh yep I have 16 books different genres so let's hit it I have two poetry collections, and I'm not typically a poetry reader, but these looked really interesting to me. The first one is Letter Composed During a, F a Lull in the Fighting by Kevin Powers. And this was published in 2014. Kevin Powers was, um, he may still be, um, a machine gunner in the army, and he was in Iraq from 2004 to 2005. And the theme of these poems are moments that make up a soldier's life, trying to make sense of the war. So this this um, ap appealed to me immediately. I'm really interested to read poetry based on his military experiences um, from the war in Iraq. The other poetry collection is Voyage of the Sable Venus and Other Poems by Robin Costa Lewis. This was published in 2005. This cover is gorgeous. And I don't usually buy books with photos on the cover, but I love this one. Um, Robin Costa Lewis is a provost fellow in poetry and visual studies um, and a humanities fellow with an MTS in Sanskrit and comparative religious literature from Harvard Divinity School. Really fascinating. Uh, it's the debut poetry collection with the theme of the black female figure through time and roles that desire and race play in the construction of the self. Um, again, fascinating to me, so I picked that one up. I purchased five books. Um, these are all nonfiction um, with a religious theme of some sort. This book is called Reading Jesus, A Writer's Encounter with the Gospels by Mary Gordon. Mary Gordon is a um, prolific author of many, many books. She's a professor at Barnard College. This book was published in 2009. And this is, she's describing her personal journey through Bible stories. And she's pondering the strangeness of um, our Christians' views of God in human form and how we kind of form him into our image of what we believe he looks like. And she's, she discusses unresolved moral ambiguities within the text and miracle the miracle of the resurrection. So it's kind of her, her contemplation, her ideas about Bible stories, how we identify with God, and some of her thoughts on religion and theology. Um, the next one is uh, a book by Brian D. McLaren, Why Did Jesus, Moses, the Buddha, and Muhammad Cross the Road? Um, Brian McLaren is one of my um, favorite theology authors, and he wrote a book called A Generous Orthodoxy, which is another of my favorites. This book was published in 2012. He's a theologian and author. Um, he's talking about a faith based on benevolence and solidarity versus rivalry and hostility between different faith traditions. Um, he stresses empathy, humility, and hoping that all people from all different faith traditions can can team and partner together um, to fight against injustice and inhumanity. Um, so I'm not going to say they look really good because they all look really good and I'm interested in all of them. This one is um, Hallelujah, Hallelujah Anyway by Anne Lamott, Rediscovering Mercy. Um, if you're familiar with her, she's been around for a long time. She wrote Traveling Mercies. This is an essay collection and her, her thoughts and ideas about the, the topic of mercy. This was published in 2017. Um, and she's basically talking about mercy lying at the heart of all faith traditions. More, em more opportunities for empath empathy and gentleness in our faith, um, no matter what type of faith that is. Look. Here we go with the foil. There's a little, there's a foil there. I don't know if you can, there we go. The light's catching it. The next one is a book um, called God, A Human History by Reza Aslan. He is the author of a book called Zealot, which I also have. This was published in 2017. He's a writer and a um, scholar. 
And this is his history of religion and humanizing God, um, the divine version of ourselves. Uh, very similar to, um, very similar in topic to Mary Gordon's book that I just showed. Um, but he's, he's more of a cynic and a skeptic when it comes to um, religion and Christianity. And the last one is a book called Grounded by Diana Butler Bass. She is a longtime writer on topics of religion and faith. It's the subtitle is Finding God in the World, a Spiritual Revolution. I love this cover, this tree. It's got that textured, this is textured. And again, it's got foil on it. I am just, I'm absolutely ridiculous. But this book was published in 2015. Um, she has a PhD in religious studies from Duke University. She's, she discusses how more people are leaving organized religion. And she also talks about finding God in nature, finding faith in the world around us. Um, as, as believers or Christians in a, in a kind of a Western tra tradition, seeing God on our level, our, sometimes on our physical level, in, in nature, in the water, in w taking a walk through the woods, in, in the earth, and uh, really, really eager to read that one. So the next three books are memoirs. This one is super short. This is um, Dorothy Allison's memoir, Two or Three Things I Know for Sure. She is the author of Bastard Out of Carolina, and if you've read that book, you know how brutal that book is. It's a novel. This is this was published in 1995. Look at how it's really, really thin. It's a very small book. And this is kind of her memoir, um, weaving the story of her own family's history in rural South Carolina and the meaning of storytelling. So I really like her writing. This one is interesting. The title is Haldol and Hyacinths, A Bipolar Life by Melody Moezi. This was published in 2013. And she is a, let's see, she's an Iranian-American Muslim activist. Um, she was born during the Islamic Revolution and raised by Persian parents amid an affectionate and gossipy Iranian diaspora in the American heartland of Dayton, Ohio. I'm always fascinated at how people end up in, in you know, people immigrating to the United States and ending up in the states that they end up in. She's talking about being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And Haldol is an antipsychotic medication. It's a pretty heavy duty medication for people with um, living with certain mental illnesses. And it, it affects mania in bipolar disorder. It's a sedative and can also at higher doses cause a movement disorder um, that you eventually lose control of. But she's talking about her experiences with her diagnosis and how that works within her family and her culture. This next one is The Girl Who Smiled Beads, A Story of War and What Comes After by Clementine Wamaria and Elizabeth Wheel. I think this has been around for a little bit. It was published in 2019. I've seen it a few different places. She is a Rwandan author and a human rights advocate. Um, Elizabeth Wheel is the co-writer. She's a New York Times journalist. And uh, at the age of six, um, the author Clementine Wamaria and her sister, who was 15 at the time, fled the Rwandan massacre and ended up um, getting refugee status in the United States. They, from from the age of six until she left for the United States, they they fled through seven African countries, and it wasn't until she was twelve that she actually moved to the United States with refugee status. Um, but this is talking about the the Rwandan genocide and um, the her escape, her and her sister's escape, and their their paths diverge wildly. Her sister becomes a single mother and is struggling. She ends up being um, taken in by a family who basically treats her as their own. And so she and her sister live wildly different lives. The next two are biographies. And um, since the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I have, um, I'm far more interested in learning more about our Supreme Court justices. And I found this one called Showdown, Thurgood, 
Thurgood Marshall and the Supreme Court nomination that changed America by Will Haygood. And he is the author of The Butler. I don't know if you remember that movie. I think he also wrote the screenplay for The Butler. Um, this book was published in 2015, and of course Thurgood Marshall was the first African-American Supreme Court Justice. Whew, I'm trying to talk fast because the video is getting long. This one is Alex Haley and the Books That Changed a Nation by Robert J. Norrell. This was published in 2015. Um, he is a professor at the University of Tennessee. This is talking about the books that Alex Haley wrote that were so influential. The book um, Roots, which was written in 1976, and The Autobiography of Malcolm X, which was written in 1965. And after Alex Haley wrote Roots, there was a lot of controversy and scandal surrounding his source material and his genealogy that um, it, there were questions about, did his family really originate from slaves? All right, four more. These are novels. These are all fiction. <laughs> this one is um, Before the War by Faye Weldon. This book was published in 2016. Faye Weldon, again, is a prolific author. Um, she wrote the pilot for Upstairs, Downstairs, and she's a commander of the Order of the British Empire. Interesting. This is set in London in 1922. Vivian Ripple, who is 20, wealthy, she comes from the Ripple family, who own um, Ripple and Company, Company Publishers. She's, she's 5'11", plain, but 20 years old and rich, and she is at her father's publishing company, and a poor, frustrated editor named Sherman Sexton um, kind of is trying to figure out what to do because he's going broke. She proposes marriage to him, and the story develops from there. This one is The Lauras by Sarah Taylor, published in 2016. Um, she wrote The Shore and was long listed for the Bailey's Women Prize in Fiction. Um, this is the story of Alex, who's on a pilgrimage of self-discovery. Um, and her mother kind of takes her on this journey from Virginia to California. It's a coming-of-age story, large cast of characters, and it's there's a there's themes of gender identification, and it's kind of a exploration and study of identity. This one is. Twain and Stanley Enter Paradise by Oscar Huelos. Um, Oscar Huelos is a Cuban-American author. He passed away in 2013. He won the Pulitzer Prize for the Mambo Kings Play Songs of Love. And this book was published 2015. It is the story of the 37-year friendship between Mark Twain and what is his name? Sir Henry Morton Stanley. Um, Huelos took 10 years to research and write this book, and it's basically a fictional retelling of that 37-year friendship between Twain and Stanley. So it's not a short novel either. The last one is Mrs. Osmond by John Banville. Um, this cover, look at this cover I really love. There's some silver foil on that one. But this was published in 2017. John Banville is the Irish author of The Sea, The Blue Guitar, he won the Man Booker Prize um, and a bunch of literary <laughs> prizes. I don't, I'm not going to list them all. Um, this is a retelling of Henry James' Portrait of a Lady, the continuing story of Isabel Archer, who comes into a large inheritance and is kind of duped into a marriage um, to, a, to Gilbert Osmond. Um, she is... He's charming but poor and basically kind of takes her for what she's worth and is just a horrible husband. Um, she has the chance on a solo trip to Italy to leave him, escape his, escape their marriage, and she goes back to him. So it's definitely going to be an analysis and an exploration of that. So those are the 16 books that I purchased um, Sunday. Now, today I'm filming on a Wednesday. Last Sunday, I... Let me back up. I posted a video several videos ago about Book Warehouse in Kittery, Maine that was going out of business and they started to have a sell-off. And at the time, hardcovers were $2 and paperbacks were $1. And I, I went and I bought a few books then. Sunday was their last day and they were selling off everything, five books for a dollar. So I bought 16 books for $3.38 total. 
Now I felt I felt a little guilty about that because I kept thinking I kept thinking about this topic of consumerism and supporting authors and what does it mean buying all these bargain books because that's basically what they are they're brand new overstock bargain books none of them are new releases the the store is not a new release is not a bookstore for um all genres and all and new releases it's it's all bargain books backlist books which is actually the books that i tend to buy most often should i feel guilty about this no i don't think so <laughs> i didn't buy any of these books just to own the books i bought the books because they were interesting and fascinating to me and, and appealed to me immediately um it's not about consumerism. It's not about me being a consumerist. It's about me taking advantage of the pricing and the bargains that I received to acquire so many books that I had seen there in the past, but at the time were, you know, upwards of eight or nine dollars a piece. So this, had I bought all these books brand new, it would have been several hundred dollars um, for me to buy them. And I'm not at all justifying or saying that don't buy new books, they're too expensive. They are really expensive, you know. Some new hardcovers are like $30, $32 these days. Um, and honestly, my budget can't handle that. So I was really happy to um, support the employees in the store on the last day so they don't have to move out more books. I was really happy to get these books at the prices that I was able to find them at. And I'm going to go forward and enjoy them and uh, work on my sense of guilt, work on my sense of, <laughs> am I buying too much? And I do tend to buy a lot of books. I buy a lot of used books, a lot of bargain books, a lot of library books, all kinds of books. I also give away a lot. I donate a lot. Why am I justifying? Why am I telling you all this? I'm, it's not a matter of guilt. It's, there's so many different ways to acquire books and there's so many different ways to own books to each his own. And uh, let's enjoy the entitlement, the, the opportunity, the chance that we have to purchase and to take the time to read them. That's it. So, um, whew. thanks for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please do that. I would love for you to do that and thank you. Uh, write a comment below and I will see you in the next video. Bye.